Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. You will recall that we are in the middle of a project to build a diamond grinder to sharpen the carbide inserts for the hand scraper that I made in a previous video. Now the design for this grinder uses a motor that has a six millimeter key on the shaft, which means I'm gonna need to find a way to cut an internal keyway. Now I don't have a shaper, which would really be ideal for this job, there are a lot of ways to do it, but the method that I want to try is shaping it vertically on the mill with a ground high-speed steel tool held in the spindle. Now we can either do this using the quill and just plunging down and shaving material off, or we can write some CNC code to do it automatically. But either way, we need to have a way to hold the spindle in a fixed position so it doesn't rotate while we're trying to cut. Now this mill does not have a spindle break, or any kind of a spindle lock. So that's what we are gonna work on today. This is the spindle nose on my mill. This is the, again, the Grizzly G0704 and it has an R8 spindle nose. So there's an R8 collet in here. What I have right now is a three quarter inch collet in there that I use to hold TTS tool holders for repeatable depths. We're gonna take a look at that in a future video. But ultimately what I wanna do is I wanna hold a high-speed steel tool in here for vertical broaching. And this is the tool that I already made. This is just a piece of high-speed steel drill rod that I've milled out or, or ground out so that it's rectangular and has a little bit of a, of a lead-in angle on the tip. So we can put this in the, in the spindle and then use it to plunge down vertically to shave material off and ultimately cut a keyway in the part. But this needs to stay aligned because this has got flat sides. We're gonna cut a flat bottom in the keyway. If this rotates, it'll destroy the keyway and jam in the work. Now, this particular mill does not have a spindle break. The spindle just spins freely or spins under the power of the motor. Um, I've looked at several options for how to add a spindle break. Up on the top, we have the, the gears and there's an optical encoder and there's a bunch of stuff going on at the top end of the spindle. And looking at that, I didn't feel like there was really a good way to add the brake there without making some major modifications. Plus, I'm planning on converting this mill to belt drive at some point in the future. And anything I do up there will just be in the way of that. You'll note that there's also a hole in the side of the spindle here. And that's used for to, to put in a tool for holding the spindle in position for torquing down the drawbar, again, because there's no brake. Now, I looked at possibly using that, maybe putting a block that clamps around it and has a pin. And most of the designs out there, most of the YouTube videos and most of the blog entries were and posts in the forums where people have built spindle locks. That's ultimately what they were trying to do. They were just trying to be able to hold this so that you could torque down tools. And I may mess around with that at some point in the future, but because of the, the way they work with a pin just dropping into this hole, there's always gonna be a little bit of play. And I don't want any play at all. And so looking at the structure that's under here, there's basically nothing we can get at. There's a bearing adjustment collar under here that's threaded in. We definitely wanna stay clear of that. We don't wanna uh, mess with that or interfere with it. So I think the best approach is just going to be to make a couple of clamps. One that clamps around the quill and one that clamps around the, uh, the nose of the spindle and that are then attached together. And I looked at maybe doing this as a single block, but I think we're better off with two separate clamps that attach to each other. Let's go into the computer and take a look at the design that I came up with. This is a model of my spindle nose, and this isn't anything special. It's just a couple of cylinders um, that match the diameters. I just used micrometer, measured the diameter of the quill and the diameter of the spindle nose. I went ahead and modeled the R8 taper in here because, of course, I did. Uh, it's not needed at all for this, uh, but it kind of, I think, helps visualize this as the spindle nose, and it kind of helps you orient a little bit when you're looking at this. So ultimately what I need to do is lock the spindle nose here to the quill so that they can't rotate relative to each other. And the way I decided to do that is by making a couple of aluminum clamp rings, one that goes around the quill, one that goes around the spindle. So this is the ring that clamps around the, uh, the quill itself. 
Now this is just a piece of aluminum. There is, let me turn this around so you can see it, turn off the spindle nose. There is a lip on the underside of this and that lip is there to register on the square face of the quill. And that makes it really easy to get this on square so it's not cocked to one side or another. And so this fits on, it's got a clamp screw through it, quarter 28 screw through this slit uh, to clamp it on securely. And that also means we can just design this to fit exactly with no clearance because it's gonna spring open and closed as needed to fit. A couple thou uh, off isn't gonna hurt anything. This clamping, it'll either expand or the clamping screw will draw it down to hold on there. And then the lip will make sure that it's square so that this surface is exactly perpendicular, giving us a surface to attach to when we make the clamp that goes on the spindle nose. And then over on this side, we just have a quarter 28 tapped hole to accept the locking bolt that locks the two halves of this together. Now this is the nose ring. It is exactly the same thing. This is just milled out of a block of aluminum with a hole to fit around the spindle nose. Uh, and again, it's slit. So a couple thou one side or the other isn't gonna be a big deal, though um, as Adam Booth once said, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it won't hurt anything if it is. So we'll shoot as close to that diameter as we can. It's slit, and again, we have a clamping screw that clamps that on. Now to attach this, I wanted to have some adjustability, since ultimately this is gonna be, uh, this is gonna have a tool holder in it with some kind of rectangular square tool, like a broaching tool that's gonna be cutting a uh, key, keyway into a part. And we will want to align that and have it square, and so there's, there's ways you can do it. You can grab it with a wrench and just twist it in the collet, or you can you know, loosen the screw and try to move it around and tighten it back down. But I thought as long as we got a two-piece clamp here, we might as well just make a slot. So I just modeled a slot here, a little bit of extra play, which will allow the, uh, the spindle nose clamp to rotate, but also there's play on the side so it can move laterally a little bit just to make sure these bores are perfectly aligned. I thought about doing this in a single piece of aluminum. Two problems with that. One is I wouldn't have any rotational adjustability. And the other problem is that if the bores don't align perfectly, then clamping down these two clamps could put a, a pretty significant side load on the spindle bearings, and I didn't want to do that. So to clamp these together, it's just a washer and another quarter 28 uh, hex head screw. And so this provides some adjustability. Once this is all clamped together, you can then move this around a little bit, tighten down that screw, and it'll stay in that position. And then because these pieces are actually in contact across the face, this will clamp on the spindle nose and actually carry some of the thrust load from broaching directly from the spindle nose through to the quill. And I don't know how important that is or how much it is. I think for the amount of broaching that I'm gonna be doing, I'm really not worried about the tapered roller bearings in this spindle at all. Okay, let's talk about the cam setup to mill this spindle clamp. Now, the way I usually do the cam is to actually set up a separate design just for that. Now, I could work in here where I've got the original file that has the, where I actually designed this thing and uh, modeled it all up on the spindle nose. And it's possible to do the cam here. You just open the cam workspace and you, and you do setups and you try to isolate each one of these parts and mill it individually. The problem is that then you don't have any kind of a model to show where the vice jaws are gonna be or whatever other holding fixtures you're using. And if you try to bring those in and position them, it gets really complicated because each of these parts is gonna be milled in different orientations. And it gets really hard to see what you're doing and it gets especially hard to keep track of the fixtures so that Fusion 360 can help you avoid hitting hard things like vice jaws and talon grips. So instead, I tend to make a separate workspace or a new design, and then I bring in a model of my vise. This is my Shars 440V vise that I have on my mill, and I just modeled this up. I couldn't find a model, so I just created one. 
and I just bring, drag and drop a copy of this in here and then duplicate it. It's a four inch vise, so I've got them eight inches apart. It gives me plenty of room. And then I can bring in multiple copies of the, uh, of the model and then work on them one by one. So for example, this is one of them and you can see that I've gone in and I've turned off, let's see here's the spindle nose that fits in there and I've turned that off and I've only left turned on the clamp ring that we're gonna machine. And then the same thing for this next one, I've only left on the spindle ring and here's another copy of the, the, the quill clamp ring and here's another one for the spindle clamp ring. And so then I can do each of the operations in a separate setup with a complete model of the holding fixture. So let's take a look at what we're doing here for the quill clamp or the large clamp. Now I've got a setup for this and uh, I'm just gonna mill this out of a block of aluminum. This is three quarter inch thick aluminum plate just cut to the size I need and held in these talon grip jaws. Now we made these jaws in a previous video. Uh, there'll be a link in the description. You can go check that out or you can just search for it. And uh, the way this works, of course, is these are soft steel jaws with hardened uh, grip cleats. And these cleats have little sharp teeth that bite into the stock up. The top of the clamp is only 60 thou above the bottom of the, the material. So we can mill everything away down to within 60 thou of the bottom. So the plan here is to hold this block, mill out all the excess material so we're left with the part pretty much sitting on top of a plate and then remove that in another setup. So let's talk about the operations. So first operation is just a facing operation over the top with a facing mill. And I've got a facing mill I've used, but I just picked up a Tormach Superfly. I've heard great things about them and I wanted to give it a shot on here. And I've played with it a little bit and it removes a ton of material very quickly and leaves a pretty good surface finish. So I'm anxious to use one in anger for the first time and see how it works as a practical matter on a part. Uh, next thing I wanna do is drill some holes. There's a hole here for the clamping screw and then I wanna drill a hole in the middle as an entry point for an end mill to hog out all of this material. And as a matter of practice, I tend to spot drill everything first. The, the hole here for the clamping screw, I definitely wanna spot drill because I'd like to control the location of that hole as closely as I can. The one for the end mill entry isn't nearly as important. Then we'll pull it in a number three drill and drill this for tapping and then a half inch drill and knock a hole in the center as an entry point uh, for the end mill. And I've been, I decided to go ahead and push this really hard. So I've got the Z motor upgrade. So I've got a lot more power in Z. I can move a lot faster. I can peck very aggressively. And I wanna see if I can remove this material very, very quickly and just throw little chunks of aluminum out rather than uh, winding up huge strings, which is what I would get if I went really conservatively, you know, say a thousandth per flute. And so we're gonna go as aggressively as I think I want to in here and we'll just see what happens and, and uh, learn for the future there. Now to remove the majority of the material, I wanna use adaptive clearing. And it turns out in this particular model, because I have this slot in here, it makes it very complicated. If I just tried to come in and do an adaptive clearing, I don't really have contours to select. I can you know, hold down Alt and, uh, let me show you, give you an example here. If I just say I wanna do adaptive clearing and then go in here and try to select, I can't select just this inside uh, contour to run the end mill around. Uh, I end up with this whole thing. I can hold down Alt and select just part of it, but then I get this little break in the side and that gets complicated. And so what I've found is it's a lot easier just to use the 3D contour. Um, and if I do the, adapt, the 3D adaptive, excuse me, not contour, 3D adaptive, you don't provide any geometry. You instead just tell it what the part is because it knows that from the setup. And then it goes through and figures out what it needs to mill away according to the height settings. Now I want to mill the center all the way through the stock so that when I'm done and I have to remove this kind of top hat of material, it's only on the outside and the center is machined all the way through. And so I can go ahead and on the heights, set my bottom height here to the stock bottom minus say 15 thousandths just to make sure I'm cut all the way through it. 
Um, and But if I do that with a 3D adaptive clearing, it'll try to do that on the inside of the part and on the outside of the part. And if I go that deep on the outside, I'm gonna run into the vice jaws. So I wanna do different depths on the inside and outside, but I don't wanna mess around with separate adaptive clearing. I just wanna use the 3D. So what I did is I separated this into an adaptive clearing operation for the inside and one for the outside. And in order to do this and limit it, I set up a machining boundary. So the machining boundary, you can set up, you pick a contour and then you say, I'd like to keep the tool inside this or the tool on the boundary or the tool outside. And then it'll machine, you know, according to those wishes, inside or outside. So I wanted to just machine the stuff that's inside. Of course, I have exactly the same problem in that I don't have a ring around the top. So what I did is I just clicked on this top surface of the part and created a sketch and then put a circle around this. So then I have a contour that goes around the entire part without worrying about this gap. And then I just selected that, uh, that contour in the sketch as my machining boundary. And that solved my problem. So I have this set to say only tool inside the boundary. I'm using a 3 8 inch three flute aluminum specific end mill to try to hog out as much material as I can as quickly as I can with my slow spindle. And that uh, contains it inside the boundary, does this in a couple of depths and hogs out that material down through the part. And you can see that uh, this contour that I'm punching through is inside the vice jaws so there will be no collision. Then I run a couple of contours, one around the smaller diameter at the bottom, one to clean up the uh, larger diameter here at the top, take off that last 10 thousandths of material, and then we have a second adaptive contour for the outside, or adaptive clearing. And with this one, I did exactly the same thing. I used my sketch. You can see the black line there on the top of the part, but this time I said tool outside the boundary, so it machines only the outside. And in this case, I brought the bottom height down to the model bottom minus five thou. And that, as you can see, is still a little bit above the top of these, uh, the top of the talon grips. And it's something like there's 20 thou clearance there. Now, I had an old uh, machinist friend of mine say, yeah, thou is a thou. You know, if you're one thou off of that part, it's fine. You're not going to collide. But um, I don't trust that. I don't trust the stock thickness. I don't trust the uh, accuracy of my positioning in the vise. I don't trust the tolerance stack up. So I feel a lot better with 10 or 20 thou clearance. And then the final operation, of course, is this uh, contour around the outside. So when you put it all together, we're gonna first face off the top, then come in with the spot drill, put a couple of spots, drill out the small hole, drill out an entry hole for the end mill in the center, and then come in with the 3 8 end mill, clear all of this material all the way through, contour it, and then clear the outside down to the water line, leaving this top hat on the part. And so that you've essentially got the entire part done, but sitting on top of a plate that we're gonna have to remove. And then we have essentially the same thing with the smaller clamp, the stock's a little bit different size, the dimensions are different, but it's the same set of operations. So same thing, face it off, spot drill it. I'm gonna put some drills for the ends of this slot and then contour that slot out, bore out the center, contour it, adapt to clear the outside, contour it, and that will get us to the same place. Let's go over to the mill and start making some chips. Okay, this is the material for the larger of the two clamps. This is just a three quarter inch thick aluminum that I've roughly cut out to size. Now I've got the talon grips here in the, uh, in the vise and I made these in a previous video. You can check that out if you want. These are hardened cleats that stick up only 60 thou above the registration surface of the vise jaw and get a grip into the side of the part. The idea is we can hold it by the very bottom edge of the part and then mill the entire part out of this block down to a water line and then flip it over and take the material off the back. So I'm gonna drop it in here. You'll also notice that I've reversed this jaw. Normally it would fit the other way around with socket head cap screws in it uh, that are recessed 
and you can see I'm using studs from my mill table clamping set to hold this on in the reverse direction and that's just to gain another eighth of, to a quarter of an inch by moving the cleats back this direction so I get a little bit more Z travel or excuse me Y travel this mill has plenty of Y travel to make this part the problem is that with this large vise sticking out the back of the table I get interference with the column if I go back too far and so in order to get a 3 8 inch tool all the way around the front of the part I had to flip this and I think I probably would have made it uh, without doing that but this gives me a little bit more uh, a little bit more space and a little bit more peace of mind. I'm not going to destroy something. So let me clamp this in and what I'm going to do is I'm going to clamp it down enough and make a pretty good impression with the talon jaw cleats. And then to avoid bowing the part, I'm then going to take the pressure off and I'm just going to snug it into those slot into the uh, indentations that this made. And that part should be nice and solid. There's no point in trying to hammer this down because it doesn't really matter that because the cleats have dug in, it's not going to go down anyway, even if it did lift. Okay, first order of business, use an edge finder and find the center of the part. And then use the end of the edge finder to set our Z height. Okay, the first thing we need to do is face off the top of the part, and I just purchased a Tormach Superfly. We're gonna try that for the first time today. Now, one word of caution with the Superfly is that this, I think it's an SEHT insert uh, for aluminum, is extremely sharp. It is razor sharp. At one point yesterday when I was doing some test cuts, I had this in here and I got my arm up and ran against it and I was I felt it hit and I looked down to see if there was any blood on my arm and there wasn't, but there was a big clump of hair stuck to this or it just shaved it right off my arm. So it's extremely sharp and it will take amazingly thin cuts on aluminum and just leaves a beautiful surface finish. It also throws chips everywhere, so I'm going to close the curtain here, get my coolant set up. goodness that is just gorgeous look at that can you see that yeah you can see that okay well I'm really happy with that tool next I think is the spot drill Okay, the next tool here is a number three drill, and this is the tap size for quarter 28. We're gonna put that hole in for tapping. Okay, the next tool is a half inch drill. We're gonna punch that through the center here. Give us an entry point for the end mill. Now this is a big drill to be running without a pilot on this mill. And we're just gonna try it and see how it goes. If we run into problems, we can always back off
Okay, that went really well. Um, you notice I used a very aggressive pecking cycle because I did not want to end up in a situation where I had these big spirals of aluminum flying all over the place. And it looks like we got through that just fine. Okay, the next tool here is going to pull out the majority of the material, and this is a 3 8 inch 3 flute end mill, and this is polished, uh, so YG1 uh, Aluminum Power, it's a specific um, end mill designed for aluminum. And this is going to be a long op, and we're just going to carve everything out. Okay, you can see what happened there. We actually, this uh, tool actually pulled out. That is ugly. See that? We got a huge gap here because this tool actually pulled out of the collet. Wow, look at that. Okay, um, and it just went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until it actually went through this thing. So um, uh, it doesn't look like we damaged anything except maybe that tool holder. We'll take a look and see exactly what's going on there. Um, let me turn the cameras off here and uh, do a little cleanup work and see if I can figure out if the tool's okay and if we can continue here. Okay, this thing definitely was uh, pulling down into the part. You can see the horrible finish. You could see it pulled out a tremendous amount up here. So what I did is I took this whole, tore this whole thing down. The tool looks okay to me. The tool holder looks okay to me. I did notice there was some oil on the shank of the tool holder. And I also have not been using the official Tormach collet in here. I had switched over to a Shars one that seems to run a little truer. But in this case, I don't think it matters. The difference is like, you know, three tenths off center. So six tenths total run out and on a tool this large, it's not gonna be that big of a deal. Uh, so I went ahead and switched back to the Tormach collet. I also noticed there was a little bit of oil on the shank of the tool holder. So I wiped that all down, wiped out the collet, cleaned them both with acetone to make sure they're completely clean, and then torqued this thing down just as hard as I felt safe torquing it. So we're gonna take another run. I've re-zeroed on the part. I have reposted the code so that we can start with the adaptive clearing here and we're gonna give it a try. Now, if for some reason this doesn't work, we'll just switch down to a quarter inch tool and we'll just take longer to mill the thing out. I love this 3 8 inch tool. When it works, it clears a lot of material really quickly. Of course, when it doesn't work, it does what you just saw.
Well, after all the drama early on, this actually looks pretty good. Let me check the inside diameter of this and make sure that we're close to our target. Again, this is going to be a split clamp, so it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's okay if it is. It's like 3.065. And our target was 3.068, so we're within 3 thou. I think I might repeat that last contour pass on the inside. Okay, I just uh, reposted and I'm just gonna walk around this outside contour where I set the stock to leave to minus 1 thou, so it should take 1 thou more. There we go, 3.068. That's exactly what we were shooting for. Okay, I'll take this part out, clean up, and then we'll do the other clamp. Okay, I have the smaller piece of stock for the smaller clamp uh, set up in the vise exactly the same way. We've zeroed on the center and the top. I've got the Superfly in here. Let me pull the curtains and let's face it off. And now a quarter inch drill to relieve the ends of the curved slot that we're gonna cut over here so that when we plunge down and slot it with a quarter inch end mill, we're not trying to you know, go right into the end of the thing. When we come down around the end, we'll just be taking the edge because the majority of that material will have been relieved. And now a quarter inch end mill to cut out this curved slot. Now I'm gonna be watching this really close because it's a small mill, it's gonna be in very tight quarters, there's very little clearance. I thought about using an eighth inch end mill for this, but I think the quarter is gonna be okay, but I'm gonna be watching it real close and keeping the chips blown out. Because if the chips pile up in here in front of the cutter, uh, that's bad news, we'll all snap it off in a heartbeat. Okay, that's good. We even came really close to cleaning up those drills, the drill marks, so I think we're good. Okay, here we are back to the 3 8 inch end mill again. So just to be really, really sure, I'm wiping out the collet with acetone. And I'm wiping off the top of the tool shank with acetone. Let that flash off for a minute. And mount the tool.
1.733. I can take that. Right on the money. So let me take this out, clean up a little bit, and let's take stock of where we are. Well, I said I was gonna figure out where we are, but where we are is in the middle of a freaking aluminum snowstorm. Um, I'll get this cleaned up in a little bit. In the meantime, though, the parts turned out great. I love the finish that the Superfly left on the top of these. Um, it's it, as good or better than the, uh, than the face mill that I've been using. Uh, to finish these out, we're gonna need to bore, counter bore, and drill and tap for a clamping screw, and then slit these with a slitting saw. Uh, but before we do that, we'll need to remove these top hats. This technique works really well. You can see the little tiny marks. Maybe you can, maybe you can't see the little tiny marks left in the side by those low profile clamping jaws. They just barely go in there, 10, 15 thou, but they get a real secure grip on the part. I'm very happy with the performance of those. But we gotta remove the top hat. Normally you would do this uh, by flipping it over and holding the part in soft jaws. I have a different idea. I wanna take these over and take this off on the lathe. And we will work on that next time. In the meantime, if you're enjoying these videos, please give me a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.